Well, hey friends, it's great to be with you on this second Sunday of Advent. As most of you know, I always love preaching and teaching at Christmas, but, but I don't think I've ever been as eager and grateful to be talking about Christ coming into our world as I am here in 2020. Each week we're focusing on a meaningful line from some of our favorite Christmas carols. This week it's the opening line from one of the most familiar carols, Silent Night, Holy Night. It's a curious opening line to a song when you think about it, because silence and singing would seem to be opposite experiences. And there's something about Christmas that brings silence and singing together, as if one gives birth to the other. Maybe you've heard the backstory to Silent Night. It dates back to 1818, 200 years ago. In a small town in Austria, a pastor named Joseph Moore was planning the Christmas Eve service. And that was going to be especially challenging that year. Uh, the nation was still recovering from a devastating war, and, and many people in town were struggling financially. And on top of that, the church organ was broken. How would they celebrate Christ's birth without music? Well, as he walked home from a church gathering the night before Christmas Eve, he paused on a hilltop and, and looked down on the peaceful, snow-covered village. And the scene brought to mind a poem he had written some years earlier about the night Christ was born, bringing peace to a troubled world. And it occurred to him that they would be the perfect words to sing on Christmas Eve. But he had no music for it, and no organ to play it on, even if he had. Well, the next day, he brought the poem to the church organist, Franz Gruber, who hurriedly composed a simple tune that could be played on a guitar. So on that night in 1818, for the first time on Christmas Eve, people sang, Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, sleep in heavenly peace. Out of silence, a song was born. A song that brought comfort and joy in a season of distress and sadness. And that's what we're looking for this Christmas, comfort and joy. As we worry about a, a surge in COVID cases in the wake of the Thanksgiving holiday, as we wonder if and when the economy will ever bounce back, as we wait for a vaccine that can't get here soon enough, and as we try to imagine celebrating Christmas without concerts or parties or family reunions or candlelight services, where will we find comfort and joy this season? Well, last week we learned that we find comfort and joy when we help each other hear and believe that Christ has come. Like Mary and Elizabeth did when they came together to, to share the stories of their unexpected pregnancies and assured each other that it really was true. God was at work. Messiah was on the way. But, but not everyone is as quick to believe as Mary and Elizabeth were. In fact, in that same opening chapter of Luke's Gospel, we meet a man, a good man, a godly man, who had a hard time believing the whole thing. And the truth is, we all have a hard time believing it sometimes, especially since it happened such a long time ago. And since the peace the angels promised still feels a long way off. So how do we find comfort and joy when our doubts keep getting in the way? How do we sing the songs of Christmas when we don't really feel like singing, when the world seems too dark, when we've run out of things to say? Well, let, let's meet this good, godly, and somewhat skeptical man. His name is Zechariah, and his story is told in Luke chapter 1. And we've asked our favorite storytellers, Scott and Megan, to help us hear the scripture in a fresh way. So let's begin with part one of the story. 
In the days when Herod was king in Judea, there lived a priest named Zechariah. His wife, Elizabeth, came from a good Jewish family. They were good people, and they lived a full life, serving God and living according to His Word. But they had no children because Elizabeth never was able to conceive. And so the years had gone by, and now they were past the age of such things. Zechariah was performing his duties as a priest when he was chosen by Lot for a great honor to enter the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and burn the incense. And a crowd gathered outside the temple to pray. But when Zechariah entered the holy place, there appeared an angel of the Lord standing to the right of the altar where he needed to approach and burn the incense. Zechariah stopped in his tracks, terrified. And the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will carry your son. You will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many people will celebrate his birth. Your son will be a man of God, and he must not take any strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even in his mother's womb. He will turn the hearts of the sons and daughters of Israel back towards their God with a spirit and power like the prophet Elijah. He will turn the hearts of the fathers towards their children, the foolish toward wisdom, and prepare the people to meet their true king. Zechariah opened his mouth. How can I believe what you just said? After all, I'm an old man, and my wife, she's also on the older side. The angel replied, I am Gabriel, who stands in the very presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. Meanwhile, the crowd outside had grown restless, wondering why the priest was taking so long. Then Zechariah emerged, blinking in the light. He was unable to speak, and he kept gesturing. He has seen a vision, someone exclaimed. And when his rotation of service was ended, he returned home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and and for five months she kept this to herself, saying, Thus has the Lord done for me. He has seen me beyond the way anyone else saw me. Now, as we just heard, Zechariah was a good and godly man. Luke tells us, Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. Zechariah was actually a priest, a member of the clergy, who helped other people find their way to God. So Zechariah was a good and a godly man, but, but he was also a disappointed man. This writer, Luke, uh, who was a physician as well as a historian, uh, tells us, he says, they were childless because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, childlessness is, is always a heartache for, for those who long to have children. And it was especially so in those days, because it brought with it a certain shame and, and disgrace, as, as if something was wrong with them. And even though they're well past the childbearing years, it seems they'd never really gotten over their disappointment. And along with his personal grief, Zechariah was also disappointed for his people because after centuries of prayer and patience, God had still not come to rescue Israel from her enemies. But on the positive side, here in the twilight of his career, Zechariah had finally been selected to enter the holy place and offer incense at the altar. Now this was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Uh, the ministerial equivalent of being named starting pitcher for a World Series game or, or, or playing first violin in Symphony Hall. It was a great honor. But, 
But as he entered that holy place and approached the altar, he was startled by the appearance of a heavenly being waiting for him there at the altar. This was terrifying. Had he done something wrong? Was he in trouble? Uh, the angel tried to reassure him, but, but then went on to announce the most unexpected and unsettling news. He and Elizabeth were going to have a child in their old age, and not just any child, a very special child, a forerunner of God's Messiah. Now, up until that point, Zechariah really hadn't done anything wrong. But in that moment, he'd said something that wasn't all that priestly. How can I be sure of this, he said. I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now, you can't really blame him for asking the question, right? I find a certain comfort in the fact that even a good and godly man like Zachariah, even a member of the clergy, found it hard to believe sometimes. How can I be sure of this? And Don't we all ask that question sometimes when it comes to our faith? How can I be sure there's a good and powerful God out there when there's so much pain and suffering in the world? How can I be sure God sees me and, and knows me when there are billions of people on this planet? How can I be sure the Christmas story really happened, that a virgin gave birth, that God became one of us? How can I be sure that Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead? I mean, these things aren't easy to believe, any more than it was easy to believe that an aged couple would have a child. So. You really can't blame Zechariah or us for asking sometimes, how can I be sure? Well, uh, apparently the, the angel was less enthusiastic about uh, Zechariah's question. I am Gabriel, he says. I stand in the presence of God. Now, that's angel speak for, do you know who I am? <laughs> then he says, and now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. So Zechariah loses his ability to speak. And as we learn later, he, he loses his ability to hear until the child is born, which means that he will spend the better part of a year in complete silence. No sounds coming from his lips or into his ears. And as terrifying as it was to have seen that angel, Zechariah must have been even more terrified by the prospect of nine months of silence. Remember, he's a priest. He makes his living speaking, teaching, reading, praying, leading people in worship. Now, now he can't even tell the waiting crowd what happened to him. I mean, this is a preacher's nightmare, right? The audience is on the edge of their seats. You've got a killer illustration, and you can't tell it. Silence can be terrifying, or at the very least, uncomfortable. The philosopher Blaise Pascal famously said, All of humanity's problems stem from our inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Now, if you don't believe that, think about how uncomfortable those first moments of a Zoom call are, when everybody on the screen is just sitting in silence, staring at each other. You desperately want someone to say something, but you don't want to be the one to say it. Now, if you still don't believe silence is scary, listen to what happened when some Harvard researchers actually put people alone in a room for 15 minutes without music or reading materials or their smartphones. They were left solely to their own thoughts. And the results were startling, almost universal regardless of age, gender, or background. Almost all the subjects said they felt uncomfortable and had a difficult time concentrating, even though there was nothing to interrupt them. 
Some of them couldn't take it and actually bailed out after five or six minutes. Now, to make things more interesting, some participants were given a button that when pushed would deliver to them a painful electrical shock, just so they could experience some form of stimulation. Nearly half the subjects pushed the button. Most of them pushed it repeatedly. One of them pushed it over a hundred times. Anything was preferable to sitting in silence. But why? What's so uncomfortable about silence? Could, could it be that in silence, we're, we're left to ourselves, to our own thoughts and fears and, and insecurities? Could it be that without anyone or anything to distract us, we have to face the truth about ourselves and about the world? Uh, some years ago, I went to my first silent retreat house. I, I was just there for an overnight, trying to make some time for study and prayer. And there were a dozen or so guests there, but we weren't allowed to speak to each other, not even to say hi when, when we passed in the hall or gathered for worship or when we sat together around the dinner table. Now, I'm an introvert, so I should have been fine with that, but I was surprised at how uncomfortable it was. I wanted to know who these people were, where they came from, what they did when they weren't on retreat. I wanted them to know who I was. But why? So, so, so I could put us all in our boxes? You see, when you're silent, you can't manage other people's perceptions of you. You can't spin your own narrative. You have to just be who you are and face who you are. And that can be uncomfortable. So, so we do our best to avoid that. We fill our days with noise. Activity, entertainment, conversation, small talk, tweets, podcasts. We're so desperate for stimulation, we'll scroll through our newsfeed just looking for something to get mad about. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with conversation or entertainment or small talk or even the occasional rant. But constant noise, nonstop stimulation has a smothering effect on our imagination. It rattles our nerves. It disturbs our peace. It, it short circuits our psychological well-being. It actually prevents us from being and facing our true selves. It, it keeps us from engaging the real world and the real people that are right in front of us. Silence can be terrifying, but it can also be just what we need. As awkward and uncomfortable as those silent retreats are, I've had some of my richest experiences of God's presence on those retreats. And they almost always involve singing, alone in my room or out in the woods somewhere. So this pandemic has imposed a, a certain silence and solitude on us that we're not very happy about. And we're especially unhappy about it at Christmas. No travel, no trips to grandma's house, no office parties, no carol sings, no, no Nutcracker Ballet or Handel's Messiah or Radio City Music Hall, no Faneuil Hall Christmas tree lighting, no candlelight services. <laughs> it's enough to make you want to push a button and shock yourself just so you can feel something. But what if there's something waiting for us in the silence? What if there's something to be found in the stillness, in the solitude? What if there's a song waiting to be sung? You know, we, we, we typically look on Zechariah's silence as a punishment. How can you be sure of this old man? The angel might have been saying. 
How about I shut your mouth and give you nine months to think about it? <laughs> but what if it wasn't a punishment? What if it was an invitation? What if it was a gift? The gift of silence. Time to think. Time to be. Time to close your ears to everything but your own thoughts and the whispers of God's Spirit. Because as it turned out, something remarkable happened to Zechariah in those months of silence and stillness. It didn't happen to him as much as it happened in him. Let's have Scott tell us the rest of the story and, and see what might be waiting for us in the silence. The time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she safely delivered a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard what the Lord had done for her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they prepared to circumcise and name the child according to the custom. And everyone assumed that the boy would be called Zachariah after his father. But then Elizabeth spoke up. No, she said, we're naming him John. And the elders said to her, no one in your family has this name. So they made signs to the father, asking, asking him what he wanted to call the child. He gestured for something to write with. And then he wrote, his name is John. Everyone was speechless, but not Zachariah, because immediately his voice returned and he spoke, praising God. And Zechariah, who had not believed, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed be the God of Israel, he said, who has visited his people and not forgotten us. Then the neighbors were in awe and talked extensively about these things. The story of Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John was discussed in all the local villages of Judea. And everyone who heard it wondered, What then will this child be? because it was evident that God had done this. And the baby, called John, grew. Well, it was a big day for the community, the naming of this baby. You get the impression that Zechariah and Elizabeth were a much loved couple. The whole town had celebrated with Elizabeth when she became pregnant. And now they all came out to celebrate with Zechariah, now that he had a son to carry on the family name. But when Elizabeth said something about naming him John, they went running to the old man. After all, he was the boss, right? He, he would set his wife straight. Well, the text doesn't tell us this, but I like to think that Zechariah gave his wife a knowing glance as he took that wax-covered tablet in his hands. And as the crowd leaned in and watched, he soundlessly carved into the softened wax, his name is John. And at that moment, words came tumbling out of his mouth. Not just words, but a song. It's the second song recorded in Luke's Gospel. We call it the Benedictus. And the first words of that song, the first words to come out of Zechariah's mouth after nine months of silence were, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. <laughs> well, Zechariah has come a long way from, how can I be sure of this? He not only believes that God will do it, he's convinced that God has done it, all of it. He's granted them a child in their old age, and he's come to redeem his people. He goes on in this song to proclaim all the good things that God has done and is doing for his people. Then he describes the special role that his son John will play in preparing the way for that deliverance. And the final lines of the song go like this. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the land of darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path 
of peace. Beautiful words. Now, let me ask you something. When do you think Zechariah wrote that song? Do you think he came up with it there on the spot in the moment with everyone staring at him? Or is it more likely he composed that song in his head, in his imagination, during those nine months of silence and solitude, when all he had to think about were were the words of Scripture and the longings of his heart and the sight of his wife's growing belly. And, And isn't that where all songs are born? In the silence of a songwriter's imagination? Don't they hear it in their head first and then start plinking it out on the piano? I caught a few minutes of a TV special the other night with a popular singer-songwriter. Earlier this year, he had been working on a new album. It was a collection of cover songs, his version of other people's songs. Well, then the pandemic hit and everything shut down. The recording studio, the jam sessions, it all went dark and quiet. And he found himself alone with his thoughts and his piano. And in that silence, in that solitude, a a song emerged, a new song, an original song, and then another, and then a fresh vision for the whole album. Sometimes, out of silence, songs are born. So it was for Zechariah and the world that first Christmas, and so it can be for, for us and the world this Christmas. And if we'll lean in and listen, we'll discover there are new songs waiting to be sung, new insights, new traditions, new moments with God, new movements of God to be discovered in this COVID Christmas. Well, a lot like many of you, we had to scale back our Thanksgiving plans. At one point early this fall, when the virus seemed to be on the decline, it it looked like we were going to have the whole family, all 18 of us together, at our house for the holiday. We hadn't seen some of them since last February. It was going to be crowded and chaotic and noisy and so much fun. Well, in the end, as you can probably imagine, it turned out to be just the two of us. And we were sad about it and mad and dreading a long weekend in a quiet house with all those empty seats around the table. But but to our surprise, it ended up being a meaningful and even memorable Thanksgiving. Karen boxed up all the crafts and projects she was going to do and shipped them off to the kids. And we connected with all of them three days in a row over Zoom. We we did crafts together and played Kahoot and built gingerbread houses, had a birthday party. And at the last minute, we decided to do the first Sunday of Advent together, lighting a candle in each of our homes. We discovered ways of connecting that we'd never experienced before and established some traditions that I expect we'll keep up for many years, even when 2020 is a distant memory. And I'm guessing a similar thing might be happening in your life during the silence and solitude imposed by this pandemic. What new things are being birthed in your heart and home these days? Maybe the change of pace has allowed you to discover some new spiritual practices, like like praying the daily examine that that Ruthie and Taylor taught us a few weeks ago. Maybe you found a podcast or two that's stretching and growing your faith. Maybe as parents, you're becoming more engaged in the spiritual nurture of your children now that you're doing Kids Town at home. Maybe your small group has has grown closer, even on Zoom. Maybe you find yourself more attentive to your neighbors 
more engaged with needs in your community or the city. Maybe you've come to a better understanding of, of race and justice, form some relationships with people who are different from you. Zechariah wasn't happy to be plunged into nine months of silence. But out of that pregnant silence, a song was born, along with his son. And we're not happy about nine months of restrictions and isolation. But if we'll lean into the silence and the stillness, we might just hear some new songs being sung some new practices and relationships being formed, some new traditions being established. So, so, so it turns out we can find comfort and joy this Christmas if we'll quiet ourselves long enough to hear a new song. We can find comfort and joy at Christmas when we quiet ourselves long enough to hear a new song. Well, as, as we finish up, let, let's come back to that familiar carol. Was it really a silent night when Christ was born? I mean, it makes for a sweet opening line to a song, but what was it really like around that manger? I flipped ahead to Luke chapter 2, which, which is the only account we have of Christ's birth, and, and was surprised to discover how quiet it actually was. I, I don't think I'd ever really noticed it before. When you read Luke's account of the night Christ was born, no words are recorded. Joseph doesn't say anything. Mary doesn't say anything. The cow doesn't say anything, in spite of what the cartoons tell us. Yeah, yeah, but what about the shepherds? I mean, they were a rowdy bunch. Surely they must have made some noise. Not according to Luke. Luke tells us that the shepherds spoke to each other as they made their way to Bethlehem, and that they spread the news to the town as they made their way back to the hills. But around the manger, not an earthly word is spoken. The only sounds we hear in Luke 2 come from heaven itself, as the angel announces Christ's birth, and the heavenly hosts burst into song. And it brings to mind the opening line of another Christmas carol, not quite as familiar. Let all mortal flesh keep silence, and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly-minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descendeth, our full homage to demand. It really was a silent night and a holy night when Christ was born. So, so let me invite you to lean in to the silence and stillness and solitude of this Christmas season. There will be fewer parties to attend, fewer trips to the mall, fewer services at church, and we'll miss them. But let's not miss the opportunities provided by that silence and that solitude. Sit quietly in front of your Christmas tree. Step out the back door and look at the stars before turning in at night. Go to the bookstore or go online and find yourself an Advent devotional. Spend time in the scriptures. Read them to your children or your grandchildren, even if you have to do it over Zoom. Let's do what Mary did. Let's treasure these things and ponder them in our hearts. Because we'll find comfort and joy when we quiet ourselves long enough to hear a new song. And we'd like to provide you with some of those moments right now as we finish up this service. First, we're going to listen again to that familiar Christmas carol. And then we'll enjoy some quiet moments around the communion table, reflecting on the bread and the cup 
which remind us of Christ's coming to be with us, even in this Christmas like no other. And then I'll invite you to join us later tonight for our third evening of prayer. We're going to gather on Zoom. You can find the link on our website at grace.org slash prayer. And, and as always, if you have a personal need or question of any kind, don't hesitate to reach out to me, Brian with a Y, at grace.org.